study course in homeopathy by Dr. Elizabeth Wright. Content Chapter 1 The Meaning of Homeopathy Chapter 2 The Epitome of Homeopathic Philosophy Chapter 3 Know the Patient Chapter 4 Know the Remedies Chapter 5 The Evaluation of Symptoms Chapter 6 Repertorizing Ken, Boning Hussain and Borike Chapter 7 Prescribing Potency Selection Reputation Chapter 8 Prescribing Aggravation Chapter 9 Remedy Relationships Chapter 10 The Danger of Homeopathic Prescribing Chapter 11 The Pathological Prescribing Chapter 12 The Problem of Suppression Chapter 13 The Management of Homeopathic Patient Chapter 14 Problems Confronting One When First Attempting to Prescribe Homeopathically Chapter 15 Strange, Rare and Peculiar Symptoms Chapter 16 The Crux of Homeopathy Chapter 17 Timing in Prescribing Chapter 18 The Value and Relation of Diet to our Homeopathic Remedies Chapter 1 The Meaning of Homeopathy What is Homeopathy? The orderly mind has a notion one should begin with definition and resorts first to various dictionaries. In this instant, the result is unsatisfactory as the definitions are, for the most part, partial and even positive statement often inaccurate, as in case of Dorland's medical dictionary. As far as derivation goes, the word in the Greek means similarity of feeling. The four fundamentals of homeopathy, as stated by Hanuman in his organon, may be briefly put as follow. First, the proving of substances to be used as medicines on the healthy. Second, the selection and administration of so proved medicines according to the law of similars. Third, the single remedy. Fourth, the minimum dose. Granting that these are the four fundamental tenets of homeopathy as set forth by its official sponsor and founder, Hanuman, the question of the status of homeopathy arises. Is it a system of medicine? Is it purely sectarian term? Is it a therapeutic specialty? In order to be able to answer this question of status, we must get down to simple fact and see not only how homeopathy differs from the regular medicine, but what they have in common. We always like to begin with a common basis. What is the object of all the consent to a physician? We should answer categorically to cure the sick, to prevent others from becoming ill, to raise the standard of health in the public. How does modern medicine try to accomplish this? First, by finding out what normality is through the study of anatomy, physiology, physiological chemistry, etc. Second, by finding out what the varieties of illness health are. Modern medicine emphasizes the fact that many disturbances of health are due to psychic or sociological causative factors. Aside from this, searches for anatomical or physiological changes in the sick person and classifies these changes when found under some disease nomenclature. This search is called diagnosis and it feels that the possibility of cure depends in large number on the certainty of diagnosis. The organic structural changes due to ill health which it finds before on after death is termed as pathology. It means it finds that many diseases are accompanied by some variety of bacteria, which is considered to be one of the causative factors. In short, modern medicine feels that it must find out all the facts which fit in with its concept of disease. To all of this, the homeopath subscribes, but he feels that this is but the beginning of what he must learn about his patient. The spontaneous characteristic things that each patient longs to tell, be they very general or minutely particular, are of special interest to the homeopath, for they individualize the case, bringing out the particular patient's reaction to the disease he suffers from. These salient points, the busy modern doctor feels that he does not need to know as to him, they are not signposts, but clutters. 
At this point, modern medicine is ready to try the cure of the disease it has diagnosed. What law of cure does it follow? First, the common sense principle of rectifying anything mechanically wrong and instituting appropriate hygiene, diet, etc. When it comes to giving the actual drug, each year fewer and fewer are thought in the medical schools and with the expectation of new proprietary substances are found in the pharmacopoeia or in common usage. Those that are given are not uniformly governed by any one law. The intent is to give them on a physiological basis, which means that they are experimented with the laboratories in crude dosage mainly on animals. It is more or less expected by analogy that what slows the heart in the frog, rabbit or dog will do so in the human. Only very occasionally recently are pharmacological experiments done on relatively healthy humans. In addition to the laboratory data on animals, many remedies are tried out empirically on patients and passed into the general usage in accord with their success. Some few forms of modern therapy are aimed at the individual as a whole taken as a type, for instance, endocrine therapy. But the majority of the modern drugs are given for a definite physiological effect on some one organ or function of the body and so given irrespective of the varying individualistic of the patient who may have that organ or function disordered as for instance lagorgs, digitalis, diuretics etc etc. A large part of modern therapy is not even aimed at physiological alteration the drug being given according to the law of Draris nor at chemical antidoting such as alkalis for acid stomach but is frankly an only palliative as in the various anodynes for headache neuralgias etc most of the modern drugging in short is aimed at individual annoying symptoms and make no attempt to get back to the constitutional cause of the disease the success of this type of therapy is necessarily uneven more and more modern medicine has come to realize that a deal of it is it suppressive. For instance, some asthma specialists hold that the removal of eczema with slaves bring out asthma. Some syphilologists hold that the checking of early syphilis by salvation and mercury treatment leads to a marked increase in the number of tertiary neurosyphilis cases. Some medical men feel that the heavy salicylate dosage drives rheumatism in on the heart and that the classical quinine does not eradicate malaria as it often returns yearly or is frequency superseded by neuralgia. It is an interesting fact for further systemic study that many cases of apparent cure prove to be those in which the drug given on the physiological or symptomatic basis were unknown to the prescriber and a similar in the homeopathic sense to the case in hand. Let it be then clearly understood that homeopaths need the accepted scientific training, procedures of diagnosis and laboratory data that their special technique begin at the moment of starting therapy Although they bring to this crisis of cure a broadened philosophy of illness and special knowledge of each individual patient, what this philosophy behind them is will be the subject of our lecture. What the extra knowledge of the patient must be and how to get it will be the subject of the subsequent lectures. Homeopathic therapy is based on the hypothesis ancient as hypocrites that like cures like similia similibus curenta that this principle is veridical law of nature that persists and enlightened practice of homeopathy can prove it must also be demonstrated by laboratory techniques but the symptomatic working out of this has not as yet been done mainly because homeopaths are so 
be gilded with the practical application of it that they have not given substitute attention to the laboratory end we have sketched modern medicine's approach and attitude and have shown up to what point homeopathy conquers it must not be aims to give briefly the main point of differences between the two which will be more fully developed in the rest of the course first that there is a natural law of cure like cure slide second that the basis of the therapy is vital rather than physiological one that is that the vital force must be stimulated to cure the patient and that only can be done by really cured that any other drug therapy is palliative or suppressive third that the single remedy at a time is all that is needed which follows from statement 1 because there cannot be two things more similar to others the single remedy has the further advantage that when one thing is given one can be evaluate its action whereas if four are given you cannot know which helped or in what proportion fourth that a minimum dose is essential this is based on arnshell's law that small doses stimulate medium doses paralyze and large doses kill in other words that the action of the small and very large doses of the same substance on living matter is opposite under this head comes the whole potency question of which you will hear more in the later lectures and which is by many considered the greatest nag in homeopathy but which together with the law of similar is the key to the whole matter fifth that the homeopathic materia medica must because of the law of similars be composed of the result of the remedy ex- experimentation with small doses on relatively healthy human so called provings sixth that disease is not actual entity but a name given for classification purpose to manifestation of departures from normalcy in human seventh that individualization is essential that is that no two people are exactly alike in sickness or in health and that although even homeopaths must classify they draw vastly finer distinctions for example to ordinary medicine there is but one disease pneumonia although with se- several subtypes bronco lobar type 1 2 3 and 4 to homeopathy there is as many types as there are remedy symptom pictures any drug in the homeopathic materia medica may be called for pneumonia although one will le- rarely need another outside of 30 or 40 in frequent use theoretically there should be as many types of pneumonia as there are people who have it but owing to the small number of proved remedies compared to the substances that might be proved there can only be as many pneumonia types to date as we have remedies for homeopaths in other words classify pneumonias as aconite bryonia gelsemium phosphorus tartar emetic pneumonias etc eight that suppression is one of the greatest danger in medicine this will be taken up in one of the later lectures ninth that chronic disease is a constitutional matter and has a philosophical bearing on prescribing which is of inestimable importance one cannot do through homeopathy without a concept of chronic disease having given the main point of contact and differences between homeopathy and regular medicine we shall now return to our previous question as to the status of homeopathy it is not a sectarian term 
although even in slight study of its history will often show how it has been necessary for it to be considered once both by its opponents and it its adherents it is therapeutic specialty and as such is more easily grasped by the modern students but it is much more than that system of medicine is a term which convey little to my mind it sounds like somebody's textbook or a treatise on one of the minor opathy homeopathy is not a pathy it is first part of the term homeo the similarity which we must bear in mind it is a method of cure according to law based as all great things are on a far reaching philosophy it is the center core of medicine whether recognized or not and is thoroughly compatible with the best of the modern science